In the subsurface, you could lease out oil and gas. You could lease out water rights. You could lease out your airspace. Billboards do this. The guy may own the grand, but the billboard's stuck in the air. He could lease the airspace to a billboard. You could lease to a cell phone tower. Now there's another option in here called a lease purchase. All right. We spoke several chapters ago about this thing called a lease with an option to buy. This is a lease with a contractual obligation already in place to purchase at the end of the lease. Notice these are two different things. One is a lease with the option to buy. One is a lease with the obligation to buy at the end of the lease. This is a little stronger offer to a seller than a lease option because the seller could always say, yes, but at the end of the lease, they may not buy my property and I'm back in the same boat trying to sell my property. Why would I want a lease option? And you would say, okay, how about this? How about we lease it? And at the end of the lease, we will buy it Guaranteed, it's contractually obligated. That is called a lease purchase. I've used it twice. And it worked both times successfully. And it worked in the same situation of a couple getting a divorce. And in the big case, the wife was my client, the husband maintained the residence, the wife, who was the big breadwinner, decided to buy another house. The problem with that is what? She cannot buy a house while she's married because the husband would own half of it. Even if you're arguing and in the process of getting divorced, in the eyes of the law, you're still married. So she could not buy a property because of tenants by the entirety. That husband may have had a claim to his right to that property. So what we did is we went to the seller and said, look, here's what we got. We've got a problem here. So here's what my client wants to do. She wants to lease the property from you until her divorce becomes final and then she'll buy it from you. But we can't buy it today. Everybody get where I'm going with this? A lease, she just leased it. And in our lease, it was an at will lease, by the way, because the lease said within 45 days after the finalization of her divorce, she would take title to the property in, in, as a purchase. So it ended at her divorce ended in about six months. We bought the property eight months later. But he did not want an option because in an option, the tenant has the right to say no, it's an option. This was, she was wanted to buy it and we told him we wanted to buy it with a lease purchase, but just didn't buy it now, okay? Now, the next thing in your book really should have gone, in my opinion, right below the land lease. And we've touched on this before. This is the next evolution. The first evolution is the landlord owns the lease or owns the land and the company owns the building. It is entirely possible that the company sell everything to a landlord and then turn around and lease the entire thing back 
under a sale leaseback. Now they get to write off all of the monthly cost for the land and the building. This is typically more common than just the land lease. And these are your big CVSs, uh, Walgreens. Like I said, Home Depot does this. You could go in, buy a Home Depot, 15 million. They'll lease it back from you for 30 years and they pay like $15,000 a month or something like that. So this is really just for Cameron? people. Who, I was gonna say, this is like really for companies that have like most of their uh, like merchandise leverage. It, it's mainly for an accounting issue that allows them to show no long-term debt to the company, which makes a really good financial statement on publicly traded companies. Uh, That's how I see this, all right? You get like Dollar Tree is a good example. Dollar Tree stock is pretty strong. When you look at their financial statement, they have no long-term debt because everything is a lease that goes on their balance sheet and they expense it every year. So it makes their company look financially strong because there's no long-term debt on their books. Okay. So that's the sale leaseback. So if you were looking at it kind of like an evolution, the first might be the land lease where they lease just the land. Then the sale leaseback is now they're leasing the land and the building the entire process. And we talked about Yum you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Pizza Hut, uh, A&W, they don't own any of it. All they own is the actual, I don't even know how to describe it, the franchise concept. The building is actually owned by other people. The investor owns the Kentucky Fried Chicken building. Yum owns the franchise and they operate the franchise in that building and they pay monthly rent to Joe in the form of like $8,000 a month. But he paid like $950,000 to buy that building. Marsh was a triple net lease. They did not own that Marsh building that we just talked about. An investor owned it and they rented back. And they rented at what that eleven thousand eight thirty three plus four percent of anything over a million in groceries. Even though everybody drive by and go, look, there's Marsh. Oh yeah, I know the Marsh is. Let's go to the Marsh. Marsh didn't own the building. An investor sitting in Canada owned the building because they are a sale leaseback. They sold the building. They had it built, and then sold it to the guy's name lived in Canada and his name was Heinz Kuhn, H-U-H-N, all right? Now, a lease eventually will get discharged. And when it gets discharged, hopefully for you guys, the most common way is completion. We started a lease, we ended the lease, the tenant fixed all the repairs and moved out, I gave them back their security deposit and I moved on and we got a new tenant. That lease became discharged just like a purchase agreement or a listing contract. It, it can be discharged in the form of a completion. Now, unfortunately, sometimes it can di get discharged by a court under a breach of lease. A breach is where one party or the other violates whatever the lease stated each party to do. The most common violation that we all think about is that the tenant failed to pay their monthly obligation called a rent payment to the lessor and they breached the lease. And when you breach a lease, 
because it is a contract, if they don't agree, just like foreclosure, we have to go to court to get a judge to determine if the parties breach the lease. Now, if we both agree, once again, it's a contract. We both can agree that you breach the lease and you agree that we breach the lease. We terminate that contract peacefully, but that typically doesn't happen. There are two ways or two types of breach that we're going to discuss. The first one is called a suit for possession. And this means possession of my rights, not possession of the property because you want all the rights back. This is typically called the actual eviction. An actual eviction. This is the lessor suing the lessee. All right. The lessor, landlord, suing the lessee, the tenant, because the tenant breached the lease. The most common one that everybody thinks about is the tenant didn't make their monthly rent payment. They can breach the lease in any other area. The example that I gave you earlier about where our tenant was actually grooming dogs in the garage, our uh, lease set only to be used as residential property. She breached that clause and potentially put me in jeopardy with zoning because she wasn't doing what the, it was zoned residential. She's running a business. So theoretically, I could have sued her for possession of all of my rights back, which would include her be leaving that property because she breached the lease. It could be any of those terms inside of the lease. 